Uh, thank you for inviting me here. I revised my title because we're now in Alberta Stan, so I'm adopting <laughs> Putin's language and talking about the near abroad close to us that we're going to take over. I will also note <laughs> I will also I will also note that to the relief of all there's not a picture, a single picture of a tree in this presentation. <laughs> I want, to, I want to talk about uh, how we name pottery as well as identifying some of the pottery that we see on the Canadian Plains and in Alberta. We frequently refer formally and informally to our artifacts and pottery in particular by phase names, which is, in my view, horrible taphonomic or, or uh, uh, taxonomic procedure. Uh, if we call it that, it can't be anything else. And, and it, it, it tends to um, encourage us not to look beyond the borders of our own little area to, to see uh, outside connections. Now in the case of ceramics that are associated with basant points in Alberta, to my knowledge we just have a few crumbs of this and that and we can't really do much to identify those. But further to the east in Saskatchewan we do have some pottery and we can carry on with identifying that pottery in other areas. And in fact, uh, this pottery is found over a wide range of areas and times beginning down in Nebraska, uh, in middle woodland areas. So the pottery that we refer to as Basant was first identified in the 1940s in Nebraska as scalp punctated. And that's the uh, the term that I think I'm going to go with. I'm in the middle of writing a book on Canadian Plains pottery. Well, I would like to say I'm in the middle. I'm probably <laughs> not there yet. Uh, and I started this as a, this is my six month sabbatical project. I, I, I know pottery fairly well, I can do this. And so I got started and about a week into it, I heard this wildling voice say, you know nothing, Dale Waldy. <laughs> The more I, deeper I get into it, the less I think I know. But these ceramics are, these, these, this pottery, uh, scalp punctated, is, uh, is known over a very wide range of the plains and woodlands and uh, through a wide variety of cultures. This is not something that we can call basant pottery. We, the, that pottery type is definitely found with basant points on the plains, but that's not all it is. And I think we need to consider external influences uh, on these potteries uh, by recognizing the names that they were called basically much earlier on. I might think about Avery Corded because um, one of the founders of our department, Scotty McNeish, identified this pottery in Manitoba as uh, Avery Corded. And I can't decide if I'm just a good, strong Canadian nationalist or I will just go ahead with the prior publication rule. This is what it looks like, it's not pretty. That's a simple profile uh, pottery with uh, probably sprang weave, uh, bag made, interior punctates and exterior uh, uh, bosses as a rule. This is a vessel that doesn't have punctates, that is probably also scalp punctated uh, out of uh, Antelope Creek which is very near the Alberta border. Many of these ceramics I talk about aren't quite in Alberta, but they're pretty close. So they're probably in Alberta at some point. Rock Lake Net Fabric Impressed. Uh, this is uh, a ceramic that was first found uh, in uh, Minnesota. This is from the Miniota site. Allison Landles ran that. It's a net impressed surface, but it's found in Minnesota beginning about 3,000 years ago. It was first recognized in uh, Manitoba and identified as uh, Rock Lake. Folks in Minnesota recognized it somewhat later on and called it Brainerd. So we have this little bit of controversy between about what it should be called. Uh, I think it should be called Rock Lake because it's of publication priority. 
Americans think it should be called Brainerd because that's what they call it. So we're, we, we argue about that. Uh, I suspect the Americans will win on that one. But I'm going with Rock Lake. This ceramic type or ware is found with points that have been identified as Oxbow, Pelican Lake, Basant, Samantha, as well as with Avonlea points. So it's not Avonlea pottery. Simply finding that pottery doesn't mean you have an Avonlea site or Rock Lake site. You need more information to tell you what particular uh, cultural historical entity you're working with. I inadvertently referred to Rock Lake as Avonlea pottery quite recently, and David Meyer gave me a little bit of whack in the back of the head on that one. So don't call it that. It's primarily dem uh, in Canada, primarily uh, located in Manitoba and Saskatchewan in parkland areas, both in association with Avonlea points and with other materials as well, with non-Avonlea points. In Alberta, we find uh, Rock Lake on the uh, open plains as well. I am working with, uh, I'm, I'm going to make pottery, talking about pottery and describing po pottery much more complex as I, in my book anyway, whether people want to pick that up or not. Uh, I think one of our issues with, with identifying ceramics in a very general sense is that we miss a lot of the de variation in the pots. And, and in, in particular, we might be missing some uh, spatial differences. So I think we need to be a lot more careful about identifying types within wares. And we see here, this one's from the Garrett site. It has rather a different uh, approach to decoration from the vessel I saw, showed you before. And, and from this vessel from Alberta. There is a fair amount of variation there. And whether this proves to be temporally or spatially important, it is something that we need to record so that we can discover those differences. Truman Mounds parallel grooved is also frequently found with Avonlea points. In fact, this is from the Avonlea type site with those nice parallel grooves on the vessel, simple profile. Uh, again, this type of ceramic is found in other areas, in other cultural historical entities, and again, it's not simply Avonlea pottery. So if you find parallel groove pottery, that doesn't mean that you have an Avonlea site. In Saskatchewan and Manitoba, these parallel grooved, uh, parallel grooved ceramics are found primarily on the grasslands in both Avonlea and non-Avonlea contexts. In Alberta and Montana, they're found uh, in the open grasslands as well. Uh, this is a parallel grooved vessel out of Antelope Creek, very clo close to the Alberta border. Uh, and I, I do, I include this one because I wonder if uh, we might not be overgeneralizing our idea of what parallel grooving looks like. We saw those nice, broad, thick, spiral parallel grooves on the body. Uh, I saw this and then I look at this vessel from Fort Clark in North Dakota, which is simple stamped, a parallel grooved, uh, sorry, uh, grooved paddle. Looks fairly similar, but there's a very different technique involved. I think we need to take a little closer look at our exterior surface finishes here. Etheridge ware. It's, Etheridge ware is known as Etheridge ware, old women's pottery, and Saskatchewan Basin late variant. I like Etheridge ware primarily because it has publication priority. We find Etheridge ware in sites with Avonlea points. In my view, that means, other than gen beyond general principles, we shouldn't call pottery old women's pottery if we find it with Avonlea points. This is a complex profile ware with a variety of decorative techniques and a variety of uh, surface finishes.
including spraying weave, cord wrap paddle, uh, obliterated surfaces. We do feel generally that Etheridge ware was probably made by Blackfoot peoples. This is our first attempt to identify an ethnic group that early on, probably because it lasts all the way through to the uh, early contact period, we think it's probably Blackfoot. And these are the uh, Avonlea Horizon sites in which we find uh, Etheridge Ware. I want to talk a little bit more about old women's pottery, Etheridge Ware, and, and I'm a bit behind the times with this because there's been a master's thesis produced and, and Barney has talked a, bit, a little bit about uh, uh, this pottery in a, in, a, in a paper that he gave me but I haven't read yet. <laughs> yeah, he shot at me. Uh, so I'm not quite up to speed on all this but I want you to take a look at the, these pots, they're all called old women's pottery. So this one, this one, this one. To me, to my eye, there are profound differences in form, decoration, and surface finish amongst these vessels. And if we simply amalgamate them into one descriptive term, we lose the variation that's in those assemblages and we lose our ability to identify spatial temporal differences in the archaeological record. That is, we lose the dynamism of the human past in that time period. And I, I, I personally think that that's a particular problem with archaeology of the old women's phase. We tend to treat it as a very large 900 year long block of unchanging time where people basically did the same thing over and over again. And people just don't do that. And I think if we get into more detail analyzing our artifacts, we will see the dynamism that we're going to see later on. I think that's going to be present as well. Those are all old women's pottery. Mortlach. Last from about 1200 AD to 1700 AD or so. This is the distribution of Mortlach ceramics that I'm aware of. You know, it goes way over there into western Alberta. I've been accumulating these data over a fair number of years. And broadly speaking, joining the dots, that's the area within which we find Mortlack ceramics completely overlaps or overlaps to a great deal with, uh, with the known distributions of Etheridge ware. But I'm more interested in those great big blanks within that territorial area. I don't believe those are blank. I think that's a gap in our knowledge, not in the distribution of Mortlack ceramics. And for any of you out there who know of collections, I will travel, <laughs> especially over here, in a very interesting area in here, uh, to take a look at your pottery, to include in my book that I'm part way through. <laughs> I, I find that those gaps difficult to believe. I, I'm pretty sure those are gaps in our knowledge. Extremely complex pottery, a uh, whole bunch of different kinds of surface finishes, different approaches to uh, decoration, uh, almost to the point where you'd think they are not from the same assemblages, except that you find them all together. I think these uh, vessels were probably constructed in uh, the same context as women's quill making societies, will, women's bead making societies where people were comp competing with each other, women were competing with each other to produce the best craft they could and the most distinct craft. 
copying designs was very much frowned upon in those societies. And I think that's why we're getting this wide variety of uh, approaches to, to decoration. I am going to go ahead and start naming types within Mortlach because we shouldn't call it Mortlach pottery on general principles. Uh, finding the type names has been a bit of a difficulty for me because Wetlaufer, who identified this pottery first, called it Mortlach check stamped. Well, we've all gone to Mortlach phase or Mortlach culture. He also found it at Long Creek, so I'm going to say I'm going to call this Long Creek dentate stamped characterized by small dentate impressions and uh, relatively small check stamping. We also find a fair amount of cord wrapped object impressed uh, vessels within Mortlach culture. I'm debating on the type name for that. It's David and Mary Mullaney use the term Wascana as a wear, I'm leaning towards a type. Uh, I personally am not a big fan of Wascana because uh, uh, Alice Kehoe used the term Wascana and that was primarily aimed uh, at what we're now calling Selkirk uh, in northern Saskatchewan. So it's going to be either Lake, Lake Midden or Wascana wrapped object uh, at some point when I make up my mind. But there are, uh, there are quite a few differences in how these uh, pots are decorated. I want you to pay particular attention to is this move? these little s hollow tool stamps and just, just their general appearance. It's going to be interesting later on. But these decorations very much mimic known <coughs> Plains Group's decorative patterns. Uh, when we look at this uh, that doesn't really look like a circle anymore, does it? But if we look at that as a circle, we can see the very general uh, similarities in design uh, that uh, Plains groups used on a variety of their crafts. One gun phase, and I've been digging at Clooney for some years now, is primarily identified through its ceramics, Clooney complex ceramics. And these terms are from Bill Byrne. I think that time the Clooney, sorry, the one gun phase lat was around a little longer than most folks think. Not a lot longer, but a little longer, from about 1690 to 1750 AD. This is where I've seen Clooney complex ceramics. Southern Alberta and over on into uh, southern Saskatchewan, Myra Creek and Antelope Creek. And you'll notice that overlaps a lot with the Mortlach and one gun phase assemblages. And that's what's, that's, this is where we start to really see the dynamism of the late pre-contact period in the material culture. We've got a lot of overlapping cultures in the same area at the same time. There's a very dynamic situation there and, and uh, our ability to uh, follow that dynamism is enhanced by recognizing all these different types of pottery, I think. We're seeing a lot of things happening. And this is Clooney dentate stamped. It looks, there a lot of uh, comment has been made about similarities between uh, the various Mortlach types and, and the uh, Clooney complex types. I we, we keep measuring, all, we do this, we keep measuring all the tool sizes, all the tool impressions, and the distance between the impressions uh, between Mortlach complex uh, ceramic assemblages and Clooney complex ceramic assemblages, and they are quite separate. It, it's still coming out quite separate. They also have uh, there are, we also find cord wrapped object impressed vessels in Clooney assemblages. Again, much larger two tool sizes and spaces between decoration marks. And this nasty fabric impressed thing. It's the only 10 minutes already? Oh, oh. Uh, 
It's the only one we've seen. It looks like fabric was impressed on a, on a uh, very wet clay surface. I want to talk about this one quickly, a new cl Clooney complex vessel type. This thing's been bugging me since I first saw it in 1989. I didn't know why, so I started writing on the book. It, I took uh, uh, an impression of the surface. I looked at it, wow, sent it to David Meyer. David, do you see what I see in this? And he wrote back saying, I don't know what you see, but I see a row, rows and rows of glass bead impressions on the surface, which is what I had seen. Kind of helps us date the pottery probably uh, proto to early contact period pottery. This uh, is the first one we've seen in Alberta, or indeed the Canadian Plains, first one we've recognized. But glass beads were used in uh, uh, decorating ceramics uh, in the US. This is done from Fort Clark. Notice how that, those nice, they, al they always put the beads uh, up so that the hole is present. It looks an awful lot like those hollow tool stamps when you, uh, when you look at them. And we see those down in Cheyenne River, Biesterfeld, Fort Clark, and then way over at EAPK 17, 10 kilometers west of Claire's home. So Claire's home, beat impressed. <coughs> I'll click on through here. I want to talk a little bit about Devil's Lake Sourceford. Why would I be doing that? That's a woodland phenomenon, right? I don't think so. We're finding a lot of miniature vessels, some in mounds, some in campsites, through this whole area of Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, and down into North Dakota. Now, David Meyer identified some vessels recently, uh, miniature vessels, and assigned them to the Mortlach culture. And I agree with that. I agree with that approach. The, but this, the question of how to identify these vessels has arisen down on the Northeastern Plains as well, where they're talking about, well, we should identify all of these as Devil's Lake Sourceford. And another group says, well, we should identify these according to their local wares and leave them within, say, Northeastern Plains Village Complex or Devil's Lake Sourceford or something else. I have a solution that I think will work better. Certainly these vessels vary in form a little bit over space, but they do conform generally to local ceramic assemblage uh, characteristics. They also indicate a continuity of ideology and ceremony. So I think if we can call these by their, give them type names within our uh, cultures and identify a Devil's Lake source for tradition, uh, we might be able to recognize both tendencies. This is from the British Block Cairn in Alberta. We're also finding Middle Missouri pots, actual Middle Missouri pots in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, but oh, very close to the Alberta border. <laughs> Fort Waite, Yatesware, LeBeau, Stanton, and Knife River Fineware. Uh, a, lot have been, a lot has been made of relationships between, how much time do I have? Uh, seven, minutes. seven minutes, I'm good. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of has been made about relationships between Mortlach, one gun phase, and Middle Missouri ceramics. So they're much like Middle Missouri ceramics. I'm not sure they're all that much like them, but in fact, the Middle Missouri folks do appear to have come up with their pottery. So, and this is the same time period that we see Clooney and Mortlach. So I don't think that the relationship is as close as, as some might think. That in fact, there is clearly Middle Missouri and Mortlach and Clooney people were interacting some way or another but Middle Missouri pottery looks exactly like Middle Missouri pottery, whether it's in the Middle Missouri or on the Canadian Plains. It's the same stuff. It hasn't changed. Mortlach and Clooney are somewhat different. I suspect this is a result of 
a very long tradition of trade in pemmican and, and maize uh, that was occurring on the plains. This is knife and refinement ware. This is Stanton ware found uh, near Mortlach, Saskatchewan. That's a very different looking pottery. And this is a Sanger ware vessel, S-shaped, S-rim, with cord and pressed uh, decoration uh, that was found on the west edge of the Great Sand Hills in Saskatchewan. A pretty classic piece. It has characteristics of both Sanger and Fort Yates, but that's a matter of very detailed uh, taxonomic practice that we won't get into here, but it's there. So Middle Missouri ware is present on the Canadian Plains, and I think if we start looking for it, we'll probably see more of it. This is a type that I've named myself, Elliott Village uh, Cord Impressed. David Meyer indicated that I use the term syncretic. That's kind of what this is, sort of on Mortlach vessel forms, but with uh, a much cruder uh, uh, cord impression. And that's found throughout Saskatchewan and uh, Manitoba. I want to finally end up with Hunter Valley Edge Paddle, which I named some time ago, from two examples from the Hunter Valley site, and I made some suggestions about relationships with uh, Stony people. I'm regretting I did that. <laughs> I've retracted it several times. I'm retracting that again. Uh, Basically, a, it looks like an edge of a cord wrap paddle was used to decorate the entire body of the vessel. And because it had been found originally where stony folks lived, I thought I'd go with that. But I have since discovered that it's found at Hunter Valley, out of the Rumsey Cairn, and over at Mortlach, Saskatchewan. So I'm just going to leave that. Hunter Valley edged paddled, it's a good type, I stick with that. I will refrain from trying to assign any ethnicity to that. So that's my overview of the ceramics that I've been working on so far. Uh, thank you for putting up with all these types, and I hope to provide more in the near future. Thank you.